more. So that's that's what I'm trying to show in the book is the connection between these theories of the Constitution and what the federal government could and could not do, and how anti-slavery politicians develop a project to get the states to abolish slavery, and how the war accelerates that process uh, uh, and and puts that project on steroids in a way until you until you actually get. Uh, the complete eradication of slavery in the United States. Hi, this is Tony Williams, a senior fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute, and I am very pleased to bring you another episode of Scholar Talks. On today's episode, we are very pleased to have distinguished scholar James Oakes, who is going to talk about his new book, The Crooked Path to Abolition, Abraham Lincoln and the Anti-Slavery Constitution. Uh, and I just can't say enough good things about this book. So excited you're, you're on and that we're gonna be diving in in a minute. Uh, but by way of introduction, uh, James Oakes is the Distinguished Professor of History at the City University of New York. And he's one of the leading historians of 19th century America. His pioneering and path-breaking books include The Ruling Race, Slavery and Freedom and Interpretation of the Old South, The Radical and the Republican, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln and the Triumph of Anti-Slavery Politics, and Freedom National, The Destruction of Slavery in the United States, 1861 to 1865. He's also a two-time winner of the very prestigious Lincoln Prize. Uh, and uh, I think you're going to win again for this one, quite frankly. Uh, so, uh, Jim, thank you very much for joining us. Well, it's very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, let's dive right in. Uh, in the book, you state that your views have, have changed over time and that you now embrace the idea that the uh, anti-slavery constitution is, is more persuasive than the pro-slavery constitution. Uh, can you please maybe explain those differences between the two and why you might have changed your mind? Well, let me just correct one little thing about sure. that. Uh, I find the anti-slavery constitutional argument more persuasive than I once found it. But one of the points I'm trying to make in the book is that there is that there was an anti-slavery constitutional argument that was robust and intelligent and well worked out alongside the more familiar pro-slavery constitutionalism that we associate with, say, Judge Tawney's decision in the Dred Scott case, which is a fully elaborated version of the pro-slavery constitutional argument. We all know that argument. Everybody quotes from the Dred Scott decision, but we don't really fully appreciate how, how robust and powerful the anti-slavery constitutional argument was. And that, I didn't appreciate that. Uh, uh, for many years. I wrote an article many years ago, basically taking the William Lloyd Garrison position on the Constitution that it was a pro-slavery document. But when I started studying anti-slavery politics, uh, and, and I first encountered the anti-slavery Constitution in my studies of Frederick Douglass, I thought, well, those are interesting, but a bit eccentric. But the more I dived into it, I realized that uh, his views of the Constitution were actually much closer to the mainstream of the Republican Party and ultimately to Abraham Lincoln than I once realized. And that Lincoln was articulating an understanding of the Constitution that was as close to universal among Northerners as you could get. So. And, and since it's not just a, a, a something that's of interest as intellectual history or as constitutional history, that's the interpretation of the Constitution that basically took control of the federal government when Lincoln and the Republicans won in 1860 and 61, and it determined their policies during the war and led ultimately to the destruction of slavery in the United States. So it's, it's an enormously significant body of thought that we don't really know very much about. So that's one of the reasons I wrote that book. So. Right. And readers will definitely know more about it. Uh, and so uh, what were uh, Lincoln's anti-slavery views and, and how does he come to hold these, these positions? 
Well, he's he's a lawyer, so he knows how to think in legal terms. Uh, and he grew up in an anti-slavery household, so he was always anti-slavery. So uh, he he one of the one of the there are two attributes of Lincoln that make him interesting to me as a historian. And one is that he's so he's such a good writer and speaker that he articulates the anti-slavery position so forcefully and so clearly that you could just read him and you know what the anti-slavery position is. But the other thing about him is that it's a completely unoriginal position. If you've read a lot of anti-slavery thinkers, you know that he is not saying anything that lots of other people weren't saying. He's just saying it better. So and that's important because it means he's in he's picking up something like the mainstream view of anti of the anti-slavery constitution that is that is held by virtually all anti-slavery politicians who are clearly the majority in the North, certainly by 1820. And so uh, understanding where he gets his views, understanding his views and where he gets them from is basically the same thing as understanding the history of anti-slavery constitutionalism. By the time he takes up anti-slavery politics in the 1850s, it is a fully formed well-developed body of thought about what the Constitution does um, does not allow the federal government to do in an effort to put slavery, as Lincoln said, on a course of ultimate extinction. Right, and and you describe that in your book as the anti-slavery project, as yes, the anti-slavery Constitution, and and so that takes shape in in the decades leading up to the Civil War. And you provide a, a very thorough analysis of that. Can can you provide a, a few examples uh, of, of that anti-slavery project? Sure. The anti-slavery project is a set of policies that the federal government can pursue in an effort to get the states to abolish slavery on their own. So the first thing you need to know about slavery in the Constitution is that it left it, it's a federal constitution and it left questions of personal status to the states states determine who can and can get married they determine the laws of indentured servitude they determine master servant law labor law and they and it's a, and slavery is a state institution understood to be a state institution the federal government by uh, by a virtually unanimous agreement, universal agreement, cannot abolish slavery in the state. But what can it do then, short of abolishing slavery in the state? And that's what the anti-slavery project is all about. What can the federal government do? Well, it can do a lot of different things. It can, for example, ban slavery from the Western territories. It can inhibit the re recapture of fugitive slaves by guaranteeing due process rights for accused fugitives. It can ban slavery, uh, the importation of slaves from the Atlantic slave trade. It can abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. It may even be able to regulate the interstate slave trade, certainly the coastwise slave trade. And it can do all these things on the assumption that if, if the federal government does this, uh, uh, the slave economy will not be able to survive on its own, and you can restart the process of state-by-state -state abolition that ended when New Jersey abolished slavery in 1804. So that's the goal. The goal is to use the powers available to the federal government, short of directly abolishing slavery in a state, to get the states to abolish slavery on their own. And and I try to show in the, how the Civil War doesn't alter that goal, it accelerates it, and that we wouldn't have a 13th Amendment if, if during the Civil War, Lincoln had not pursued those policies to the point where enough states abolished slavery to ratify a 13th Amendment. Right. And so there's a direct correlation, there's a direct relationship, I'm trying to say, between this anti-slavery project that you first start seeing abolitionists formulate in the 1820s and 30s and the what you end up with with the ratification of the 13th amendment in december of 1865 that you can't understand the one without the other okay very good and so let's dial in a little bit on lincoln again uh, okay. so he's roused to enter national politics after kansas nebraska becomes to really national prominence obviously is then elected president uh, 
how do his anti-slavery constitution views, you know, affect his his rhetoric during the 1850s, affect his his viewpoints and and even his uh, you know his responses to events like Dred Scott and Bleeding Kansas and so forth. Well, over the course of his life in politics, he he endorsed many of the specific policies associated with the anti-slavery project. As a young legislator in the state of Illinois, he, he argued explicitly for the first time, the first time he ever makes about slavery, that the con Constitution empowered Congress to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. And when he is in Congress, uh, the following decade, he actually drafts legislation to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. And of course, as president, he signs the law that does abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. So that's one thing. In the 1840s, when the issue of slavery in the territories comes to royal American politics, he takes up that cause and says that votes for the what's known as the Wilmot Proviso, which would ban slavery from all the territory acquired from Mexico during the war against Mexico. So he supports that position and he goes into the war favoring a ban on slavery in the territories. He advocates, uh, he begins to advocate in the 1850s for uh, due process rights for accused fugitives, it says so explicitly. But he also takes up certain understandings of what what the federal government can do in wartime that it cannot do in peacetime. So that there is part of the anti-slavery constitutional argument is that uh, in peacetime, the federal government can't touch slavery in a state, but in wartime, the federal government can, in an effort to suppress an insurrection or repel an invasion, uh, uh, confiscate the property of, of the enemies. And if they are enslaved, you can actually free them. You have the right under the power, under the war powers clause of the constitution to emancipate slaves confiscated from the enemy during wartime. And that policy they begin to implement, Lincoln begins to implement within weeks of Fort Sumter, right? So that he takes up that and he warns that, he warns of that in 1859 in the speech he gives in Cincinnati and he repeats the warning in his, inaugural address. You know, you complain that we're not returning your fugitive slaves, but what do you think is going to happen if you secede from the Union? He says, and th then your fugitive slaves, now only partially returned, will not be returned at all. He's, it's quite clear. It's quite clear that he has accepted that understanding of the War Powers Clause, that if you leave the Union, you will forfeit your rights under the Constitution to your slave property. So all of that stuff is bundled into Abraham Lincoln's politics by the time he becomes president and allows us to understand the actions he took as president in, in, uh, in an effort to restore the union and at the same time uh, act on his anti-slavery convictions and the anti-slavery convictions of the Republican party. Right. Now, one of the, the more difficult, obviously uh, challenging, complicated, controversial uh, topics in your book uh, have to do with uh, Lincoln's views uh, on slavery, but then also on race itself. Can you uh, spend a little time kind of unpacking his views? Uh, on <clears throat> sure. Uh, there, there's a way in which his understanding of, of slavery and his understanding of race both need to be put in the context, again, of federalism, right? That there are certain things the federal government cannot do about slavery, and there are certain things only states can do. The same thing is true to some extent uh, on when it comes to racial issues, right? So Lincoln is a believer in fundamental natural rights that all men are entitled to, as he says in 1854, if the Negro is a man, my ancient faith tells me that all men are created equal. And that means they are endowed with the right, the natural right to freedom. Right. Slavery is a violation of the principles in the Declaration of Independence, and that is true for blacks as well as whites, for men as well as women. And it sounds obvious and airy in certain ways today, but in the 1850s, that was a very controversial position. He got smashed at it uh, by Stephen Douglas for, for taking that position. His Douglas's position was the, the, the Declaration of Independence actually means all white men are created equal. And some of the slaveholders in the South actually repudiated the whole notion of fundamental human equality. So to, for Lincoln to say all men are created equal means blacks as well as whites. 
and uh, is to take a fundamentally racially egalitarian position uh, that was not universally accepted among whites in the United States. So there's that. There's, a, there's another body of rights that uh, are sometimes ascribed to the states and sometimes ascribed to the federal government. And it was not, not clear until the 14th Amendment decisively defined them as federally protected rights. But those are the privileges and immunities of citizenship. And Lincoln comes around on that over the course of his life and becomes more and more committed to the idea that blacks and whites are equally entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizenship, that blacks are citizens of the United States. If they were born in the US, they have a birthright to citizenship. So he's, he's increasingly egalitarian on that score. Where he falls short and where he is constantly and rightfully criticized for falling short is are the various forms of racial discrimination that are left to the states to determine. States decide, who, remember what I said, states decide who can marry whom, and northern states decide that blacks cannot marry whites. So that's okay with Lincoln. If they decide black, they might, uh, blacks might be entitled to a jury trial or the right of habeas corpus, but that doesn't entitle them to serve on juries. And so northern states frequently discriminated on that ground. They didn't allow black men to vote. They often, uh, and so those kind of state-based discriminations, that, that's where Lincoln fell short. That's what, those are the discriminations he deferred to. And so historians talk all the time, and I think accurately about Lincoln's growth, what they really mean is his growth on the issue of race, because on slavery, he was always anti-slavery. But uh, his views about race, I think, were actually pushed in a more egalitarian direction as he became more committed to anti-slavery politics. That is, anti-slavery constitutionalism had a kind of egalitarian, of, not a kind of, a very real egalitarian underlayment. And that as he became more and more committed to that understanding of the constitution, he's similarly been less deferential to state-based discriminations until uh, by the end of his life, he becomes, the first president ever to publicly advocate voting rights for black men. Right? So something he had never done before the war. And, and so let's uh, maybe dig into that a little bit more, especially during the Civil War. So, and you mentioned it previously, but uh, how, did, uh, how does the war, wartime presidential powers, how do they all affect Lincoln's their constitutional ability to achieve that goal, right? Those ends of right. uh, the anti-slavery constitution. Right. Well, th the war was unfortunately, tragically, a necessary event to get to abolition, but it was not sufficient because throughout human history, wars are the primary source of slaves. Right, you you go to war with an enemy and you enslave the enemy. Uh, uh, the, the wars don't start becoming uh, taking on an anti-slavery flavor until the Enlightenment and the age of liberal revolutions in the late 18th century. Uh, and armies don't automatically emancipate slaves when slaves run to when to their lines. They do so if they are told to do so. And during the Civil War, uh, uh, starting very early on, the Lincoln administration adopted a policy of increasingly uh, uh, allowing, um, you know, of, of first, first refusing to return fugitive slaves of people who were in rebellion, of rebellious masters, and then emancipating fugitive slaves, and then not allowing, banning soldiers who disobeyed that order, criminalizing the return of fugitive slaves by Union uh, soldiers, and, and increasingly accelerating that policy. Uh, because uh, uh, this is one of the things that, it's important to understand that throughout uh, that the fugitive slave issue is a major issue in in the sectional crisis leading up to the Civil War, and no no Northerner would have gone into that war without understanding 
and knowing that once Union armies show up, slaves are going to run away and they're going to come to our lines. They, they'd been through this fugitive slave crisis in the 1850s. Northern states were increasingly hostile to the attempts by Southerners to come into their states and capture fugitive slaves. The states threw down numerous roadblocks to the recapture of fugitive slaves. So it doesn't make any sense to think that once the war begins, these Republican politicians in control of the federal government who had spent a decade or more inhibiting the return of fugitives was suddenly going to turn around and send them back. In fact, they did exactly the opposite. What they said was what Lincoln said. Look, the slaves are going to run. They always run. We know they're going to run to union lines, and we're not going to return them. And it took a while for that policy to you know, get underway, and there were soldiers who returned fugitives to their masters and got punished for it like that. But gradually, the, pro the policy becomes increasingly uh, radicalized until you reach the Emancipation Proclamation. The problem, with, the problem with the Emancipation Proclamation, as Lincoln saw it, was that while it freed all slaves who came within Union lines, it didn't actually abolish slavery in any state because the federal government didn't have the power to abolish slavery in a state. So what you see is this very interesting process over the course of 1863 when the Emancipation Proclamation is being implemented. So Lincoln begins to use that as yet another way in which the federal government can push the states to begin abolishing slavery on their own. And he launches a campaign, a full-throated campaign, in the middle of 1863, shortly after the United States Colored Troops has been, been established. And he uses emancipation to undermine the power of uh, the slaveholding interests in the various states to get the states to begin abolishing slavery. And in 1864, it works. It starts to work. And, you know, Arkansas abolishes slavery first, uh, the first state in 60 years to do so. And then eventually over the course of that year, Virginia, uh, Maryland, Tennessee, Louisiana, Missouri abolish slavery. And, uh, and without those abolitions, a 13th Amendment uh, could never have been ratified. So, so a third policy, you know, the, the uh, 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 policy of nudging the states to abolish slavery, a policy of military emancipation leads to the possibility of, an, of a third policy, which is a, a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery nationwide, to simply bypass the restriction on the federal government from abolishing slavery in a state by simply abolishing it nationwide, right? But you needed those first two policies to get to that third policy. So as, uh, you could do it, uh, if I'm going on too long, just no, say no, so. No. Uh, uh, think of it in terms of numbers. It's a question of the balance of power, right? So in 1860, when the war begins, there are 18 free states and 15 slave states. Now, you need three quarters of the states to ratify a constitutional amendment. 18 to 15 isn't going to do it. Over the course of the war, the uh, the federal government admits three new free states to the union, so that pushes the ratio to 21 to 15. That's not going to do it either. What really does it is the flipping of six slave states in the last year of the war, so that by January of 1865, when Congress finally passes the 13th Amendment and sends it to the states for ratification, there are 27 state free states and nine slave states. That's the ratio you need, three quarters. And the consequences uh, are immediate, right? Those states, every one of those states very rapidly ratifies the 13th Amendment. And by December, the 13th Amendment is part of the Constitution. So it's, it's the, 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 we're back to that anti-slavery project, right? You need to use whatever power the federal government has to nudge the states to abolish slavery. But during the war, the federal government has powers that it never had, the power to emancipate significant numbers of slaves and therefore push the states to abolish slavery and, and give it the and give it a, a nudge that it didn't have without that wouldn't have had without the war. So that's that's what I'm trying to show in the book is the connection between these theories of the Constitution and what the federal government could and could not do, and how anti-slavery politicians develop a project 
to get the states to abolish slavery and how the war accelerates that process uh, uh, and and puts that project on steroids in a way until you until you actually get uh, the complete eradication of slavery in the United States. Jim, thank you very much for joining us. The book is The Crooked Path to Abolition, Abraham Lincoln and the Anti-Slavery Constitution. By the way, this is you did all of that in about 200 pages. I mean, it's a remarkable <laughs> book because of the content, but then also it just is very readable, very well written. And, you know, it's a it's a sort of beautifully concise book. So, well, so thank you very much. I appreciate that. Very yeah. remarkable. Well, thank you again for joining us and to all of our viewers. Uh, if you like this video, please uh, be sure to subscribe to our channel and offer your comments below. We offer new content every Tuesday and Thursday, including primary source close reads, scholar talks like this one, and also homework help videos. And please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook uh, and join our conversations there. Thank you.